My name is Michael McDonnell. I am the cybersecurity librarian. And welcome to a special episode of Morrow and Mike. How you doing, Morrow? Pretty good yourself, Mike? I'm doing great. Um, so uh, tonight we're doing something a little different. We're doing a pre-recorded canned presentation. Yeah. It, it, correct me if I'm wrong. We are broadcasting live, no? To YouTube or eh? Uh, we are, but oh, just okay. the people okay. that okay. we shared this with in our Discord. Okay. okay. Um, okay. So, yeah. Well, it's all good. Um, something of an experiment, right? Doing pre-recorded videos. So just kind of uh, because, you know, our schedules are starting to get a little bit too heavy. And uh, it's it's just kind of nice to have this so it's a bit more flexible. So uh, yeah. content's still going to be great if you ask me. And uh, again, you know, if you like the video, Please hit the like button, and if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to explain. Uh, so I'm about to do a presentation that I recently did for Mount Royal University, and I am a member of the University of Calgary Information Security Club, maybe the oldest member. Um, <laughs> and uh, they weren't able to attend the Mount Royal talk. Um, only Mount Royal students and staff could because they technical ways they invite people. And so I said, oh, let's, we're just gonna redo this so that everyone can see it. Um, so I'm gonna redo that talk. Uh, Mount Royal also had another guest speaker, speaker Angela McAllister from uh, the uh, Canadian Cybersecurity, the Center for, Canadian Center for Cybersecurity, CCCS. <laughs> uh, she's uh, an academic outreach coordinator and uh, she, talks to students. She will be coming on Mike and Morrow in November um, yeah. so that we can share um, her knowledge of how to prepare for a job in cybersecurity upon graduation um, with all the students of Alberta or whoever happens to watch our YouTube channel. Yeah. And I'll actually be in two weeks time. So that'll be, uh, be nice. Oh yeah. It's just, it's <laughs> like it's November. Um, okay. <laughs> so I got this idea for this talk. It's totally goofy. Um, uh, I, I, after 10 years of giving Cybersecurity Awareness Month talks, October Cybersecurity Awareness Month, um, I realized that Cybersecurity Awareness Month ends on Halloween. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, I got goofy and I decided I need an excuse to do a bunch of graphics for my slides. And uh, a coworker of mine who's really it, uh, loves Dungeons and Dragons, um, we were talking about the monster manual. And I was like, oh, that's it. The cybersecurity monster manual, defeating things that go hack in the night. Uh, and that's what we're going to do tonight. And so this is um, a discussion of about seven different threat actors that I believe are characteristic of the most common types of threats that we're likely to hear about day to day. Um, normally, I start my presentations like this. This is a threat landscape with a bunch of graphs and data showing how bad things have gotten and how they're still getting worse. The likelihood of suffering a cyber attack is going way up, and the impact of those cyber attacks is bad and there are many other measures. I'm skipping all that and uh, basically characterizing um, all of today's threat actors as monsters. And I picked the most horrific uh, edition of the Dungeons and Dragons monster manual for this, the fourth edition, which any aficionado will tell you is just terrible. Uh, but I love the fonts and I love the graphics. <laughs> they are pretty cool. I will admit. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me... Uh, will this advance the slides? No, that will not advance the slides. So in Dungeons & Dragons, we have an alignment chart. We have uh, good versus evil against uh, law versus chaos. Um, well, the problem is, in the world of hacking... Well, they're all evil and they're all unlawful. Uh, instead, in cybersecurity, we have risk. And it's not unlike the alignment chart. 
it's the likelihood that you will encounter a particular type of threat and then what type or level of impact would you suffer and um i'm using a chart that's uh i don't think it's that uncommon i've been using this uh since the beginning of the decade it basically says you know uh you've got different categories of threats uh hacktivists uh cyber espionage cyber crime cyber war cyber all those things um uh, hacktivists, you're not really likely to encounter them and the impact, uh, despite what you might hear is usually not, um, particularly high. Um, espionage on the other hand, um, is extremely high likelihood and getting more likely. Um, Verizon Debeer has some great charts to prove that. Um, but the impact is low because they have a goal of not having an impact and not getting caught. Um, uh, you can argue that on a sort of macro economic level. Um, and then cyber war, which we hope is extremely unlikely, uh, but could potentially have devastating impact. Um, if you talk to certain Eastern Bloc countries where their lights are put out on an annual basis, <laughs> um, I think the Ukraine is probably bracing for, um, a December yeah. outage like they've had for years. And then cybercrime, which um, unfortunately is all too common. Dozens of new devastating high impact stories every day. Um, yeah, and there's so, literally not a day that you <laughs> that passes by yeah. that there's not an article about somebody, you know, getting hit with ransomware. So it's unfortunate. Uh, uh, yeah. And you know, the funny thing is I, I've been putting this particular chart. This is just copied and pasted from a slide deck from 2012. Um, and every time I do a talk, I put up some graphs talking about, well, it's becoming more and more likely. And I'm really waiting for the year where I, I can say it's leveled off, people. Um, <laughs> so uh, you and me both, man, you and me both. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through uh, a series of these actors. I'm going to start with hacktivists and uh, give a few of the details about them and we'll, we'll just have uh, fun and just an excuse for me to do new graphics for a slide deck. Um, at a certain point, um, we'll do a couple of demos of the types of um, things you're, you would likely to see um, as the actor's behaviors. Uh, so let's start off with Anonymous. Um, everyone knows Anonymous. Um, so Anonymous has the roots going back to, say, 2008. Um, and uh, we categorize them typically as hacktivists, but their motivations are quite varied because there is no organization or coherent group that you could call Anonymous. What there are is um, organizations, individuals, who will self-identify as anonymous for whatever their goals happen to be. And so really anonymous is a decentralized global hacktivist phenomenon, not a group or organization. Some people call them anarchists. Not all of them are. It's very hard to pin this down. Um, what you will, and you know, um, uh, this isn't intended to be a history of anonymous. Uh, but you will see that they have um, up in the aliases, uh, they have roots in 4chan. Uh, they were popularized uh, when LulzSec was going under the name Anonymous Hacking Sony, uh, for instance. Um, and today, um, the anonymous phenomenon, I think, is um, epitomized by QAnon, um, operating out of the replacement for, for 4chan, 8chan. Um, and the motivations are different. So the hacktivists often just want attention. So for instance, Operation Green Rights, um, uh, uh, a non-ghost back in the early days going after petrochemical companies, um, they would make bold claims. Um, for instance, uh, in Op Petrol, they would say, on a certain date, we will wipe all oil companies off the face of the internet. And they did op Israel, same thing. We're going to wipe this off the face of the internet. 
Um, then the date comes along and uh, there is no attack, um, though they might claim so. And they would post evidence of their uh, attacks. But that evidence is actually an ongoing, uh, usually uh, website defacement campaigns, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, other groups that operate under anonymous are there to harass others um, for a variety of motivations, whether they're uh, trolls or they have an activist goal or somewhere in between. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, the largest thing we see today is misinformation campaigns, which could be trolls or could be nation states. Um, the conspiracy theories we see are often nation states co-opting other groups, groups co-opting groups. It is a crazy phenomenon. Um, I look forward to, in my retirement years, reading all the books by academics, analyzing decades and decades of this um, uh, but it's it, it's it's really safe to say it's more like news fodder, people trying to get attention, right? I mean, obviously they're identified with the guy Fox mask, right? Uh, you know, all all those concepts from V for Vendetta and things of that nature, right? So, uh, you know, anarchy, anarchy, right? <laughs> um, one of the things you'll find is that um, anonymous, their impact is actually our attention, and uh, the impact that we suffer is our own reaction or overreaction to the threat. Um, and often the damage they do is exaggerated, misunderstood, and only known correctly months or years afterwards. So for instance, here's an example that's fairly recent. Uh, you might have heard in the news um, with the chaos in the States. Um, uh, it was reported that Anonymous, a group claiming under the banner Anonymous today, we hacked uh, the Minneapolis PD's uh, system and um, we leaked all these records from the police. Well, a number of analysts looked at it and said, well, you know what? A huge percentage of those are actually from prior leaks. The Minneapolis PD is very likely not suffered a breach or if they have, it wasn't a big deal. Um, you'll often see um, uh, today and back in the day. Uh, so in the LulzSec days, um, they get together and they say, okay, let's take somebody offline, the Scientologist, somebody like that. And they'd use this tool called the low orbit ion cannon. Um, and often they would claim a victory. Uh, if you read the history of these attacks and the first hand accounts, uh, the low orbit ion cannon is not an effective DDoS tool. <laughs> Even if you get a large number of people and in uh, some of the most famous cases earlier this decade, um, they actually partnered with botnet operators who could effectively DDoS, but then they told their followers, yay, guys, you did it. You, you in the low, earth, uh, low orbit ion cannon took that those guys offline, and it was uh, not the case. Um, like one of the least effective methods for DDoSing that you could be around. And don't ask me for effective methods because I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> um, and then today, misinformation is really the heart of everything. Um, uh, at QAnon has roots in many of the communities that uh, have go, on, go under the ban, banner anonymous. And this is really um, uh, a phenomenon true to the roots of that threat. And um, read The Economist there. I, I, can't, I can't find anyone who could argue that uh, that is not an authoritative or unbiased source. Uh, okay, let's move on to something a little bit um, more impactful. Um, cosmic links. Um, okay, so monster manual time. Um, <laughs> this is a business email compromise. So think of uh, Nigerian prince scams. These uh, are the guys who want to trick you into giving uh, your money away. And I've chosen to represent them as a vampire because you have to invite them in, but if you do, they will suck you dry. <laughs> and you won't know it because they will just charm you. Um, I had considered actually putting uh, romance scammers in here because they follow very similar methodology. Um, but uh, Cosmic Links is interesting. Um, the vast majority 
of business email compromise threats are uh, from uh, West Africa and the United States. And so very recently, um, oh, my my notes, sorry, I forgot the attribution. Uh, Gari, Agari covered this threat actor and they are a Russian business email compromise threat actor and that's unusual. Um, so there's also another one that's uh, uh, written up quite a bit recently, Silver Terrier. And so you will recognize these. Um, there's a whole lot of different types. And um, I'm going to give some examples that aren't necessarily cosmic links, but they're business email compromise of different types. And so um, typically what you're going to see is this sort of uh, false sense of urgency and a sense of authority. So they will make it look like it's coming from your boss or someone big in your company. Um, they'll email you, they'll text you, um, depending on the particular actor. Um, and they'll say, hey, there's a time sensitive matter, I need to resolve it. Now what uh, is special about Cosmic Links is they're really, really fond of saying, I am your boss and I need you to work with this external law firm. It's secret and it's got to be done right away. They're going to give you the instructions on how to transfer some money. And in the first email, they won't give you details. They're looking to see if you'll fall for the false sense of authority and urgency. And you know, there's a lot of personality types where you could be highly intelligent, but still fall for that urgency angle. And once they get you, they're going to make they're going to uh, like make the story bigger until they've got you uh, transferring a set of money, and they're going to play on that urgency to get you to do it right now. Um, here's another example. Uh, the email looks a little different, but it also is. Uh, I got you. You got to work with this law firm, and then this one has a few extra details, and it might be because the uh, victim is in a particular industry. Um, here's another one that's even more detailed. And this is sort of like the second email in the thread, which is, hey, um, here is all the information, you know, big words like privilege and confidential, and we need you to send this money and here's all the details. It looks very legitimate. Um, you know, the funny thing is there, you know, you could rely on technology and email security to deal with this. But realistically, it's about having financial controls in place and about awareness. Because even if you have one of those personalities that could be enticed by a sense of urgency, there's a lot of good people out there that want to be helpful. And if there's a crisis, they'll jump in. Well, being aware of these things is your antidote to your own goodness that could be um, uh, leveraged by the attackers here. Oh, by the way, Michael, I, I think I wanted to point out, uh, now, sorry if I'm interrupting and I'm jumping the gun. No, go for it. I, I, I think, uh, what, what is it? They, they always pretend to like send it from their, like their iPhone or something like that. It wasn't like one of their, one of the yeah. things. Yeah, you're right. This is a Cosmic it, Lynx. Uh, good yeah. eye, my friend. You are correct. Because uh, I think it also means that, you know, well, if there's like spelling errors, it's like, oh, I, you know, I was typing on my phone. It was urgent. So, you know, if, if some, you know, something looks out of whack, people will be like, oh, he sent it from an iPhone. That's why it's a spelling error, uh, not a big deal, right? There's actually another angle to this too. Oh, um, okay. And uh, some people in our audience might recognize this in their own corporations if they do internal uh, phishing tests. Um, uh, the smartest people, or I shouldn't say smart because it's not about smarts. The people who are most resistant to phishing attacks will still be successfully fished. They will click on links. They will respond. And the statistically, those resistant people are more likely to fall for a fish if they're doing it on their mobile device. And I think this is two, this is two things. They're sort of going, well, I'm on my iPhone. You're on your iPhone. Um, let's get this thing done. We're both people of action. And this gives you something that you can relate to and go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, 
So it just adds to that sense of urgency, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And you, you, have, you have to think this is these these attacks fail against most individuals. They're trying to find the one that's got the personality trait where they will start to go down that path and can be tricked. And who's likely to do that? Someone else who's on their iPhone, who's working with people are on their iPhone in an organization where a sense of urgency and authority mean a lot. And that's how you get tricked. Yeah, so I, I've got a little bit of a story to share, right? So Oh yeah, uh, go for it. Yeah, no, so I had a friend, uh, so he works at a company, uh, family-owned business, and they, they totally fell for the fish. Something similar to this, you know, along the lines of, oh, hey, you haven't paid your bill. Oh, we, we just switched bank accounts. So can you send the money to this this bank account instead? And sure enough, you know, it wasn't like huge amounts of money, but still quite quite a big sum of money. Like I want to say thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> so and that's the, that's pretty big. And you know, they were lucky that you know it was all transacted on Swift. And if everyone knows what Swift is in the banking world, <laughs> it takes forever for uh, you know money to clear. So you know they they caught it in time. But that person felt so bad, right? And it's like it, it really wasn't her fault because if you looked at the, at the email, it was quite. It looked very convincing. So I, I guess the thing I, I the takeaway I want to tell people is. You know, don't feel embarrassed. Uh, you know, it's it's better to admit that. You know, yes, you know, it happened. We're we're all human, right? We're all on you know tight schedules. We all get stressed out. We're all always thinking about, well, we we got to do this for the business. So don't feel like you know just because it happened to you, you're the only person that it happened to. It's better to come out clean, try and stop it as quick as you can, and you know allow those people to kind of do a, a post mortem to understand what happened, so that you know we, they they can fix those mistakes later on. Right? So. Yeah. Um, being resistant to this is about knowing that you, uh, or accepting that you could fall for it. Mm -hmm. Con artists are effective because they prey upon our better qualities, qualities that we want. <laughs> we want people to cultivate, yeah. but knowing how these scams work makes you a little bit resistant. Um, not by any means to say it's okay to fall for them, but it's okay to accept the fact that you could fall for them. Exactly. And then, uh, so, you know, um, eight years ago, you, uh, my experience was the same. The amounts of money being stolen was 30,000. Occasionally we'd hear of a client who got taken for 150,000. We're like, oh my God. And of course now these are done for millions. Oh, yeah. And that's why uh, the speculation is the reason why we now see a Russian threat actor doing this is because they are going after big game unlike um, West African threat actors who uh, their newest thing is they don't go after business to business transactions. They'll even go after uh, payroll. So I actually worked on an incident where uh, the payroll at a company got a, an email that claimed to be from an employee saying, Hey, I'm on vacation right now. And they were on vacation. Could you uh, start depositing my paycheck into this other bank account? And that bank account, wasn't Swift. It was this shady bank in the States that allows you to make an Interac uh, deposit online. So an EFT deposit that settles as um, in 24 hours and settles in the cryptocurrency of your choice. And that bank is primarily used for crime. Uh, um, it, totally legit. They're a bank. Um uh, uh let's move on <laughs> obviously yeah otherwise we'll just chew up time <laughs> yeah Th this one uh, uh this one oh, i don't know this is a favorite topic too right like i, yeah. I like this topic as well so talking about yeah the, the adversaries right that what we deal All with right. day in day out so. so the next threat actor i want to do is uh a little bit nearer to me because for years i had a presentation called energy sector Th cyber threats I've actually put a little tiny mini version. It's the very first video on this YouTube channel. Um, uh, and I used to profile, at, at that time, an exhaustive list of threat actors known in the energy sector. Oh my God, how things have changed since 2012. And this was one of the ones I, um, but it was known back then as Havex, Lights Out or Energetic Bear. Um, Today we call them Dragonfly, or if you're, you know, uh, Kyle Housen's watching and he's going to be like, 
that's not, it's Dragonfly 2, and they're a descendant of Dragonfly, and they're not the same actor. Or uh, Alec will be doing the same thing. Um, yep. I'm playing a little vague here for the audience who aren't Threat Intel analysts. Um, Dragonfly, who I'm characterizing as a dragon that is flying. Because. I like that. I like that. <laughs> nuance, right? Uh, uh, they're what we would call an advanced persistent threat. Um, they're not going away. They're government funded, the, the Russians. Um, and what they're known for is attacking industrial control systems. Um, they are essentially um, uh, spies. So, no, sorry, I should back up. They don't just... There was an incident where the original Dragonfly had malware that included code that could program an industrial control system, but what they're known for is stealing information. Um, uh, they do have a history of targeting organizations with industrial control systems, energy companies. Um, and more recently, under Dragonfly 2.0, they target... Um, uh, uh, government systems. But I want to talk about the old history because one of the things that's really characteristic about this, these guys is innovation. So much about this threat actor was only found out years after it had been analyzed. Um, and one of my favorite, there's so many stories I could tell. Um, one of my favorite examples is they... Um, would distribute their malware by compromising legitimate software vendors of industrial control software of various types. And they used a method where they would put their malware inside a legitimate program, usually an installer. Now, this is brilliant in the sense uh, that it depends upon a person's trust. Uh, the innovation here is that, well, we would like to get um, system privileges. Well, how are we going to get that? Well, stuff our malware inside a program that will always be run with system privileges, an installer. So we're all used to, we run the installer and it says, oh, do you want to make changes to your computer? And that means, do you want to run this as administrator? And we let it do it. Um, and um, I'm going to do a little demo here of how this works. Um, the point of this demo isn't to show you how to use these tools. It's actually show you how stupidly simple and automated it is to do something very, very sophisticated. So here's another example of this. Um, give me one second while I switch windows. Okay, so what I've got here is a virtual machine system. And I'm just going to take away our video and go full screen so everyone can see. Um, and I've got my victim here, a Windows 10 machine. For the purpose of this demo, I used to, so for years and years and years, whenever I did these demos, I would actually demonstrate myself bypassing the antivirus. Um, that's gotten actually really hard, and it takes a lot of time and I'm not willing to put time in for a simple demo. So we've just just killed all the antivirus. The, the point I want to show is how to make this software go. Um, so I'm going to use uh, a freely available program called Shelter, and it's called Shelter because it's going to give shelter to the malware inside a legitimate program. Um, it's also called Shelter because we're going to drop a shell on the victim. Um, the idea of sticking one executable inside another is a complex matter. You have to analyze the original executable and find out a way to um, put your executable inside in such a way that it won't crash. And Shelter does that for you. I am not the super hacker. I can pretend to know what the words you're about to see on the screen mean, but I don't really. So what we're going to do is it's it gives us a choice, and it says, hey, do you want to do automatic mode or manual mode? 
Mm, let's go with automatic. And then it says PE target. Okay, you might have to look that one up. That just means what's the path to the file that you want to stick your malware into. So I go to home user downloads. So what do I got? Um, give me one second. LS home user downloads. And it's called, so I'm going to put this inside the 7-zip um, utility because everyone would run 7-zip and even administrators do it. Um, so we're going to go back here and go... Seven uh, Z nine twenty dot exe. That's just going to warn me that it's not taking a backup because I did this already. Um, now it's going to proceed. Now it's going. Oh, let's find out if this executable is compatible with this method. Do I know how it determines that? No. And it's just flying back. Goes. Oh, let's characterize the DLL. Uh, let's look for digital signatures. Let's start tracing. And now, if you look. It's actually running instructions. Sometimes it runs hundreds of them until it finds a place in the execution of the program where it could stop it without crashing and execute your malware. And so now it's going, okay, we've created a DLL that will work. Now give it a few seconds here, still executing instructions. Now the really interesting thing about this is when you run it, it might actually fail and you can try again and try again and sometimes it'll succeed. There are also some programs for which it will never work. We might fast forward this in the recorded version. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, here, uh, here we go. Now it's going to say, is. do we want to enable stealth mode? Uh, what do you think, Moro? Do we want to run it not stealth mode? Uh, uh, not, well, you know, if, if it was only a lab, I guess, but you know, we're super, probably yeah. it's like, yeah, yeah. there are no choices that need to be made. Oh, no. And then the final part is, okay, uh, what malware do you want to put in here? And here you do need to set up a command and control server for yourself. I'm going to say, okay, we're going to do, um, a reverse HTTPS uh, interpreter. And then the only, the most complicated question it asks you is what's the IP address of your command and control server? <laughs> and what port do you want to run it on? And then it goes and generates it. Oh, and it's going to say a lot of obfuscating of the decoder. Uh, we're doing our virtual allocation. We're binding uh, something, an IAT handler. I don't know what that is. We're making some polymorphic code. We found an instruction spot. And now we're looking for the checksums. And now we're going to try the, in the final stage, it actually tests to see if the injection worked. And it goes, hey, this worked. Now, I've already started up my command and control server. Um, many of People in our audience are familiar with this. I'm just using um, uh, Metasploit's multi-handler. I've already got it set up to receive connections from a meterpreter shell. Um, in real life, uh, attackers might use meterpreter, but they might use something else. Uh, today, um, shells of this type are less common, and they use much more stealthy methods. Here, I've already downloaded it. In real life, they'd have to find a way to trick you to download it. That's not hard with a little social engineering or a watering hole attack is what Dragonfly was known for. Um, they would literally, they wouldn't try to, they wouldn't set a deadline and try to get you to install it today. They would just compromise a vendor of industrial equipment, um, controllers, SCADA equipment. And then the next time you go to download, boom, you're going to run this. Now we run this thing, and it says, oh, you got to run this as a uh, system. Okay. Now this one crashes, but you think that's, okay, so what would you do if you saw it crash? You'd say, okay, no big whooped, right? It crashed. Uh, the It was corrupted when I downloaded it. Now some of the ones I've made in the past, they run beautifully. They even install the actual program. 
But look over here. We think, oh, it's just corrupt. Maybe I'll open a support ticket. But there is an actual session that's been received. And I can interact with that session. Um, and if you haven't ever seen um, Metasploit and Meterpreter, um, it's very popular in pen testers because it makes life easy. So for instance, uh, we could take, turn on the webcam. We could take, let's take a screenshot. So it just saved it to this file. Now let's go see what that file looks like. So put up a file manager. Here's that file. Oh, look, tell me. Oh, look, it took a screenshot of our victim's machine. Uh, we can turn on a key logger. We can elevate to system privileges because that thing is running a system. Let's say get system. Um, we can, let's list the files on that system. So we were, we ran that program in the downloads folder, Java, uh, FTP mirrors, JREs. Let's go over here and take a look. And yeah, that's what's in the downloads folder. We are live on that system. We can upload more malware. We can and get a persistent backdoor by enabling a scheduled task or putting something in the registry. So every time they log on or with boots, uh, another backdoor runs, we could download a more sophisticated piece of malware to help us evade it. We could create new accounts because we own that system. And we could yeah. even probably even access the, the microphone and the webcam and all yep. sorts of things like that. Uh, in previous years in the demo, I would, in this VM, I would attach the webcam and then show oh. the audience the, uh, we'll, 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 we'll skip that uh, here. But the point is, this is exactly the way Dragonfly would work, is that they, would, um, they wouldn't be aggressive the way business email compromises. They're not reaching out to you. And then when something weird happens, even if it malfunctions, you don't think anything of it, but you are then compromised and then they expand their persistence and they don't get caught. Um, the, the history of uh, Dragonfly and similar actors is just amazing. Um, okay, so let's move on to something else that's as insidious as the type of malware that um, uh, Dragonfly used, TrickBot. TrickBot's also been in the news recently. Um, uh, Moro, tell me, why was TrickBot in the news? Ah, because, uh, you know what, uh, I, I got to give kudos to Microsoft here. Uh, Microsoft, as well as uh, several other organizations, including the U.S. government, uh, they made a concerted effort to really stop uh, <laughs> the, the the trick bot, uh, the, the CNC servers and, and things uh, like like basically the infrastructure that uh, that runs TrickBot. And uh, man, I got to say, at first, uh, you know, it looked like they were not doing that great of a job. But I think the last the latest news was, uh, man, I can't remember. Was it something like out of nine or seven servers, they had they essentially were able to like deactivate five, like five out of seven of them. So, um, you know, initially it looked like it was, it was a losing battle. Uh, it was only slowing them down, but um, right now it looks like they, they've really slowed them down. Uh, now, I, like your slide says though, they are gonna come back. Uh, I think this is just a concerted effort to try and stop um, uh, tampering, I guess, with the, uh, the US elections that are gonna happen, uh, I guess, next week. So, um, you know, probably have to keep our eyes on the news on that. But uh, yeah, it's uh, this thing's certainly nasty and it's not going away anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, TrickBot's a really interesting threat. Um, uh, as you said, I characterized it as a zombie because if you try to kill it, it rises from the dead. And so this these slides came from the week after the first attempt and it actually wasn't looking successful. There was a lot of new uh, activity uh, brute forcing of accounts. Maybe they were trying to regain new infrastructure, replace infrastructure, or just burning through credentials. Um, uh, you know, but um, they aren't. So TrickBot is two things, and you hear about it in a lot in different contexts. So it is um, a very effective Trojan, a very effective backdoor, but it's also a botnet. And so uh, it, it, it originally, you'd hear it as an information stealing or, a, or as a banking Trojan. It's there to steal financial information. Um, 
Uh, so it would do key logging, it would steal files, um, that sort of thing. Um, starting in, I want to say February 2019, you might remember a really big uptick in this new form of devastating ransomware. And uh, in around June, the FBI made an announcement that um, the pattern we were seeing in all, in all these ransomware attacks was uh, Emetet, TrickBot, and Riot. So uh, you would receive the initial infection with Emetet, and Emetet would drop TrickBot. TrickBot would be the back door where they would ex uh, stealthily explore your environment, expand their access in your environment, until finally they infect you with the ransomware, which was Riot. So TrickBot is famous for that. Um, it's known by a lot of names, and I put a few here that aren't that are threat actors who are known to use TrickBot. Um, I've only called this medium likelihood and medium impact. And okay, a couple of years ago, I would have called this high, only because of the threat actors I'm going to show after this. <laughs> uh, but let me, uh, I, I want to show a couple examples. Um, the examples I'm going to show uh, not only are examples of the way TrickBot works, but by uh, one of the predecessors called uh, Drydex, which, which is related to a, a threat actor we're going to cover in a minute. So uh, what you're likely to see um, in a number of threat actors, TrickBot's one example, is you're going to get these really compelling emails that have an attachment. So you see in the screenshot down at the bottom, there's a office file attached, doc file. And it looks like a very good reproduction of an actual Intuit QuickBooks. So a lot of businesses, small businesses, will use QuickBooks as their accounting program, um, but it also sends invoices out and collects payments and all sorts of great services. Um, now, here's the thing is, if you get that email, you're going to go, well, I don't use QuickBooks. This is, I don't, this is bogus. But if you regularly do receive legitimate ones, you're going to fall for it. So it's targeted, but not hyper specific targeted. Um, the pattern we see with uh, TrickBox uh, and a few others is it's usually an Office file. So it's a Word file or it's an Excel file. Here's another example, also an invoice, but in a different format. And if you've got an email account like mine that's been around for decades, you probably your spam folder gets filled with hundreds. I see examples like this all the time. Mm -hmm. Every Christmas when I get one day off, I like to take them apart and de-obfuscate them and see if there's anything new. Last Christmas, if you watch me on LinkedIn, I was like, oh my God, this de-obfuscation looks like art. And I don't mean that it's it's creative. I mean, it literally, when it decoded on the screen, visually looked like art. Um, and it was a, a new form of TrickBot. I submitted that to Microsoft and a few other antivirus vendors. Um, uh, many of us have seen these. Uh, tons of businesses uh, regularly, you know, get FedEx, UPS, Purolator, whatever you name it. Um, it's very easy to fall for one of these. Um, I remember an example for a company I work for. We had a really bad malware problem, and we were doing an awareness campaign. And one day, uh, users were under the awareness campaign, much more likely to approach me about suspicious things. And so one day, somebody said, "Well, I clicked on." Uh, a FedEx, uh, an attachment to a FedEx thing, and I don't think it was real. And I went up there and I said, so, you know, you don't have to open all of these. And they got very upset. And yes, I do. I, my job is shipping and receiving. I have to open all of them. And if you think about it, are they really doing anything wrong? They take their job seriously, but this is another confidence trick. Um, what you see when you open these Word files, and some of you may, I hope you've never seen this if you don't work in cybersecurity. <laughs> I hope you will never see this. But they'll, they'll make these really compelling things. So you open up Excel, and the first thing you see is this graphic. Now, this isn't legitimate. They just made it look like this. They put the real logo in, and then they say something that's a pretty good con. They say this, the document created, this document was created in an earlier version of Excel. If you want to see this content, you're going to have to enable editing and enable content. Those are the two things that this criminal needs 
in order to get their malware to run. If you don't do these, it doesn't run and you're not in danger. But they try to make it look like something is like, ah, software is always doing something. It always needs me to do something. So I'll just go along with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you'll often see is these, if you've got uh, security for office turned on, you'll get these yellow bars with big warnings saying, don't do this. We've disabled the ability to run macros, whatever the hell macros are. So they're telling you, you need to click these. Don't, don't. If you needed to click those, you would already know. Your boss or coworkers, someone would have told you you had to do that. Um, I'm going to show you a little example here. Uh, let's see if this is going to load. So be, while we're waiting, Michael, I, I think I wanted to just kind of ask you a question. Uh, now, I mean, I know the answer. I'm just, I'm just talking about this for the sake of talking about it because uh, you know it was a conversation that came up, and I think there's really a misconception out there that you know, uh, you know, you click on this and all of a sudden you know ransomware gets installed on your machine. And I'm trying to explain to the person, I'm like, well, that's not necessarily always the case. A lot of cases are, yeah, you know, it starts off with something else that gives you access to their machine. And, you know, the malware operator will go in and all of a sudden, you know, try and pivot, look around your network, poke around your system, see what's what's valuable. Once they've decided that it's worthwhile, then they'll execute the ransomware, the bit that will actually start mm -hmm. encryption. And, uh, you know, really by then it's like they have your data. And I was having an argument with this friend and I said, if they've gotten to that part, they've obviously copied your data. They have your data. Uh, I don't know how important it is, but, you know, the chances are it's probably pretty important because I would say in this day and age, uh, ransomware operators are starting to become a lot more pickier. Uh, they're trying to find high value targets. Uh, they're trying to uh, encrypt high target uh, data. So I was really having that argument, and I don't know uh, what your thoughts were on it. Um, I think that for over a year now, we've lived in a world where if you are subject to ransomware, you have to assume you've had a data breach. Even uh, so, for instance, Evil Corp, who, who we will talk about in a second, mm -hmm. um, is, you know, they're interesting because everyone says, well, they're one of the last Russian ransomware gangs who doesn't steal your data and make you pay twice. Well, that's because they're co they're connected by family to um, Russian intelligence, and they're very likely giving that information for espionage purposes. Um, so it is the case that when these little things happen, this little script runs, the idea there is to give a backdoor into your environment, and they will stay and lay low and be stealthy until they get enough access. And the whole time they can be stealing information and not get caught. And they'll do everything to not trigger any sort of detection until the very end when they're confident they can compromise everything. And that's when the ransomware shows up. Literally, the day the ransomware shows up is the day you have to realize there's a history here. And it goes back weeks or months. They've, they've, yeah. You have to assume they've got all your info. And I think that's the thing that's subtly lost on a lot of people out there that, you know, uh, ransomware didn't just kick off because you clicked on a link and, you know, it infected your network. Uh, it might have, you know, once upon a time, but in this day and age, no, they had access to your network weeks, if not months in, in advance. All right. So. so let me go over to this demo. Yes. Yeah, sorry. So <laughs> sorry. This, is an, this is an actual sample of TrickBot. And we're running this in a sandbox called any.run. Um, and this is a recording of the screen and interaction with the malware on a Windows 7 system where it ran. Now, uh, before I start, you're going to see in the top right a bunch of stuff flash. And that would the user, the victim, would never see that. That's just the sandbox showing us what's happening that the user does not see. And that's really important with these kind of uh, Trojans. So here the user opens the word file and now, okay, they read and it says, I got to enable editing. And in a second, they're actually going to go and say, enable editing and content. And just bear with me. This only lasts a few minutes. Now look at that. I'm just going to back that video up a little bit. 
as soon as those macros were enabled, processes started running. You'll see here, command.exe, so that's the DOS prompt. And that probably meant they ran a script. Again and again, now it, a ping, so they probably pinged their command and control server. Um, then look at this, something got downloaded, an executable file was dropped. So another piece of data was put in a temp directory and ran. That's the TrickBot sample. And I'm just going to fast forward, and then you'll see um, something else got downloaded. And it says it's a PGP file, but it isn't. It's probably an encrypted um, uh, piece of malware. A lot more command windows, so there's scripts that are probably interrogating the system, maybe establishing persistence, creating a scheduled task, a registry entry, um, something like that. And on and on, PowerShell ends up get ready, getting running. Uh, somebody modified a DLL, so there's probably a backdoor actually at the syst in a system file that your malware probably cannot detect once it's there. And on and on and on and on. And that's what TrickBot does, and you would not see that. All you'd see is the office file opened, and that was it. That's all you'd see is that. And at that point, you are owned. Um, okay, so let's go on to... Okay, so I got a little slide here. Um, so that, you know, what we just showed was TrickBot on its own. And what this slide shows is sort of the Emetet TrickBot Ryuk, um, uh triumvirate. And so uh, some system gets infected, uh, is infected with Emetet. The Emetet command and control tells the victim machine to download TrickBot. The attacker interacts with TrickBot and does all the backdoor stuff. TrickBot is the information stealer. Emetet is just the very, very hard to detect thing that drops TrickBot. And then once they've explored your systems, they deploy Ryuk, and that's the ransomware. And it's this shady character using TrickBot to interrogate your systems that you really have to worry about. The ransomware is just the icing on the cake for them. Okay. So let's talk about a, a threat actor who follows a very similar methodology, Evil Corp. They've been in the news. Um, so uh, Evil Corp is associated with the Tridex malware, though that's not really their thing. They used to use it. Um, they uh, These guys are really interesting for a lot of reasons. They're kind of social media stars. Like they're Russian... They're like new school Russian oligarchs. They're young. They buy these expensive cars. Uh, they buy legitimate businesses. Uh, they're on social media and that we have photos of them. I'll show you some of those. Um, originally, they used to use Drydex and they used to make a lot of money by stealing information. Um, much like the example with the original use of TrickBot where they would steal all your financial info, then siphon out your money. Now, what's really interesting about Evil Corp is, and this is a last year number, a year old number, is that in their history from about 2011 forward, they had made $100 million. Um, uh, uh, Revil was sort of related. Revil claims they made $100 million in this last year. And who knows what Evil Corp made in the last year? Um, uh, so they're known in the ransomware world as being the one Russian threat actor who doesn't steal your information and it, and then double extort you, which is what everyone's doing these days is double extorting you. I'm going to show you an example of that as well. Um, I think that what's far more interesting about them is their connections and their history. Um, they've been around forever. They've been under investigation. Um, they're really well known because they've been indicted and sanctioned. So recently in the States, they've got some laws that you cannot deal with a sanctioned entity. So if you get ransomware and it's by these guys, you can't pay them without talking to the Treasury Department. Um, 
this is uh, one of the malware authors, and he was previously involved in other ransomware gangs. Um, like the thing, another thing they're actually they're they're known much like uh, Dragonfly for their innovation in uh, in this case not uh, not just in their malware. Dragonfly was really innovative in their malware. Um, these guys are actually known for money mules. So one of the reasons why these guys can be so public is because there's very little chance of them getting caught because they make, um, in the old days before ransomware, the, the way they cash out is by recruiting money mules. And in Alberta, with so many layoffs, these mule scams are just everywhere. So you'll get, um, you've probably seen these emails. Be a secret shopper. All we need to do is put some money through your account that you can go to use buy products. And it's actually a scam. They send you a bad check. You send them a re some, some money. And then you find that the check bounces. There's a whole lot of other ways. But what they do with their mules is the mules are the ones going to the ATMs to get the money that they've stolen. And who can get caught? The mule, not the guys on the other end. Uh, there's incredible great writings on the whole history of what they've done in muling. I was at uh, an FSI SAC summit where there was an entire presentation on the dangers of money mule operations all on their own, separate from every other aspect of crime, cybercrime, money mules do a ton of damage. Um, okay, so, you know, I said with, um, with uh, the first, with TrickBot, I called it medium and medium for threat and impact or for uh, likelihood and impact. But I was like, you know, five years ago, I would have said it was much higher. And that's only because Evil Corp is so much worse. Okay, well, as of last month, it's gotten even more worse. So there's Doppelpamer. Oh, yeah. Doppel, Doppelpamer is known because they pioneered this idea of double extortion, that they would not just give you ransomware, but they steal your information first. And after you pay to have the ransomware decrypted, to get all your files back, then they come to you and say, uh, yeah, we actually stole all your files and we're going to leak them if you don't pay us again. Except la as of last month, they are now murderers. And uh, in Dusseldorf, uh, they ransomwared a hospital and someone died because there wasn't access to the information systems. Um, and there is uh, several reports in the States now of people dying when hospitals are being ransomwared. I just read an advisory today that um, gangs using Riot are specifically targeting healthcare in the States now um, because they will get paid. Um, I want to show an example here. Um, uh, so this is in the dark web over Tor. Um, this is what's called Doppel leaks. It, and uh, after Doppelpamer did this, many other um, ransomware gangs set up their own leak sites. There's dozens of these where you go and you pay them the ransomware, and then they send you a link to this site, and they put up samples of the data they've stolen as proof. They call them proofs. Um, and if you don't pay, they let anyone download it off of here. And I got to say, this is a sad state of affairs. Um, I don't know if, have you ever seen these before, Moro? Is this, is this new seeing uh, these? Not necessarily new. Like, I mean, I've used Tor browser before for other things, just for, you know, just for peeking around. But, uh, this specific site, yes, I haven't seen it. So, um, so prior to giving this talk, the first time I went and grabbed these screenshots, um, I blurred stuff out because the victims don't need to be victimized further. Mm -hmm. um, what I found really interesting is that the number of views of various victims' data mm -hmm. uh, varied dramatically. Um, and when you looked at the type of organization, it's like it's very clear that other criminals are making use of this. Um, to get the data to re-victimize those people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so here's an example. What they did is they said, okay, well, here's a list of some of the files. 
Um, and there's finance data, research data, all sorts of anything that could have stolen. Um, and you, anyone can download those and look at them. Um, they'll usually also, in the case of Doppel leaks, uh, list all the machines that they were able to discover. One of the things that I um, sort of broke my heart a little bit was some of the victims that were owned the worst had Active Directory domains that contained systems that shouldn't exist without extreme mm -hmm. isolation. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Now, uh, granted, anyone who's ever done uh, network uh, inventory assessment knows that these can be misreported, but and these could also just be machines that have not been cleaned out of Active Directory, but um, uh, this is actually from a university, and this, in my experience, is like, it's real. And there's 26,000 machines in a single Active Directory domain with dozens of extremely vulnerable machines. And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, Eternal Blue is the gift that keeps on giving to criminals. Oh, no kidding. And that's all it takes. Now, once they're on one of those machines, it's joined to the domain. The whole domain is now weak. Um, so I wanted to po point out one thing. So um, about that comment about attacking hospitals. So when COVID initially hit, you know, there was a news release from all these bad actors saying, okay, we're not going to target hospitals. We're not going to be like that, <laughs> which obviously didn't turn out that way. And even, uh, you know, even these guys, uh, they, they ended up uh, yeah, unlocking the hospital because uh, apparently they were actually trying to attack a university. And by yeah. that, they stumbled. But that's beside the point. It still caused a death. They are still murderers, uh, no matter what way you want to cut it. Yeah. Um, uh, criminals are stupid and lazy. Um, quite often, we think they're really advanced. No. <laughs> uh, and I've talked about the innovations here, but honestly, uh, um, nation state actors are very different than criminal actors, and they just need one stupid trick. Um, they're stealthful, um, it, but like, oh, sorry, we didn't mean to kill anybody. It, we, it, we, we didn't know. It's not on us. Well, no. Oh, so you were so stupid. You didn't know that universities and hospitals are the same. Like you were too busy doing cocaine with your hooker girlfriend. <laughs> um, sorry. This, that, that's just. I, I'm sorry. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. You're passionate about this topic. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that, was, I, that was unprofessional, but. Uh, and, but I do agree. I do agree. Uh, you know, no matter what way you want to cut it. And, uh, you know, there was actually a news uh, release a couple, uh, it was maybe last week, that showed that there was a few ransomware operators that had donated money to uh, charities around the world. And yeah. Michael and I actually discussed it. I said, yeah, you know what? That's not any really different than, you know, some of these other organized uh, criminal, um, sorry, uh, or organized criminal organizations, I should say, uh, that, you know, donate on a regular basis, uh, you know, giving out teddy bears uh, and things of that nature to try and legitimize their image in, in media. Not really all that different from, uh, you know, the 80s and Pablo Escobar. I mean, Escobar still like adored in uh, his, his home city of Medellin. Colombia. Uh, although, you know, if you look at all the news reports and the accounts of him and uh, what he'd done to his own population and his own people with, you know, bombings like car bombings and killing so many people, yet, you know, he, he, he donated so much money and created this other personality or veneer to kind of hide the bad, the bad part of him. And, but the reality is he's still a criminal and these organizations are still criminals. They're bad. So, um, I want to end on a positive note, <laughs> not a, not on uh, murder. Absolutely. Although this was a Halloween theme, we 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 we've, <laughs> we've got the horror stories. We do. That's we've right. got the horror stories. Uh, okay, so I'm I'm Michael McDonnell, and I am the cybersecurity librarian. Doesn't that seem like I need a nemesis? Like, don't I need an arch enemy with with like a brand like that? And I do. I do. I have a threat actor. Uh, that can be my arch enemy, the silent librarian. Um, um, early in my, uh, at, at a point in my career when I uh, decided to dedicate everything to cybersecurity, um, 
not just be a system and programmer or web developer or anything like that or IT consultant, just cybersecurity. One of my first jobs was at a university working in the library, a very uh, uh, prominent world top 20 research library. Um, and one of my jobs in security was to deal with uh, a threat actor very, very similar to this. Uh, back then it was called Pass Fans. I really had hoped for this presentation. I'd be able to dig up my old screenshots for comparison. Um, uh, Pass Fans was largely uh, Chinese and Iranian threat actors who were stealing passwords to academic accounts in the Western world to gain access to their library resources. And there's a reason for this. Uh, library resources are not often for sale in the Eastern world. And they are sometimes, uh, they cost millions of dollars in licensing. Um, so even if uh, a university in Iran could afford the license, um, they couldn't, it's not available for them to buy. Um, so there is in Iran, um, so Silent Librarian is an Iranian threat actor and they've been active uh, here in Canada, in fact, in Calgary this fall. And they were active in Calgary last fall. And uh, the CCCS issued an, uh, a, a, a private advisory to the universities. Uh, the university actually sent out a public advisory to their students saying to watch out for phishing. Here's how this works. These guys are um, partly doing this for financial and partly for espionage. Um, the silent librarian is associated with this threat actor called the Mabna Institute, which is a private company in Iran. Uh, it's like eight people, they're very well known. Uh, and they steal these passwords and then they, um, for some of them, they're thought to use it for espionage, but for some of the passwords, they actually just sell them for financial gain. Who would they sell them to? Just like with Paths fans 15 years ago, uh, Chinese academics or Chinese oh. spies or Indian or Iranian spies or anyone who wants access to these um, rather precious library resources or just universities. And under COVID, which nation state doesn't want dozens or hundreds of accounts to VPN in or use our proxies or access the emails of academics, even students. Um, so here's what it would typically look like. Uh, these guys really know library systems. Um, so they're going to send you a thing that says they are the IT for your university. And then uh, they're going to say, oh, by the way, uh, your account is overdue. You need to log in and fix it. And they give you a URL. Um, I've got another example here. This is even more library-ish. Um, I don't think this means anything to anybody if they're not a university student. But you might see this thing called Easy Proxy or a reverse proxy. And this is a very common way to access library resources. It's tied into your central university authentication. Um, and it's how you get access to these very expensive databases of eBooks and articles and things like that. And this looks really compelling. Um, and then what happens, you click that link, is you get a uh, lookalike login page. This on the left is the real site, and on the right is the fake site. And I'm going to do a demo of this. Oh, nice. Uh, except I'm not going to use a university website. Uh, when I gave this talk at Mount Royal, I cloned their website, made it an, an exact lookalike. Um, that would be rude to do that in a public talk. So what we're going to do here is close this window, find my virtual machine. Um, this is another demo that falls in the category of, um, this stuff is too damn stupid easy. You don't have to know anything. Um, I really all, I'm always torn in demonstrating this because I don't think that stupid, lazy people should be able to commit crime this easy, but, uh, there's a tool written by great, honest, good white hack hackers uh, for good 
reasons and it causes so much more harm than good in my opinion we debate this every night in our discord channel um so i know some of our community uh disagree with me it's a healthy debate um <laughs> i'm stating my opinion not everyone's opinion uh social engineering toolkit it is a well-known tool used in penetration testing social engineering and it's used in crime and i'm going to tell you it is simple as one two three so I run Social Engineering Toolkit. I didn't even have to install it. It's part of this operating, this Linux operating system. And all I have to do is go, uh, okay, I want a social engineering attack. And there are many other types of attack. You want to do business email compromise? This thing does that. Uh, and then it's like, okay, I want to do social engineering attack. Uh, what do you want to do? Website attack vector number two. So that's one, two. Uh, what do you want to do now? There's a whole bunch of stuff here. Um, I can do browser attacks. Uh, hijack tabs that you have open, um, uh, Java exploits, whatever. But I'm going to do three. One, two, three. Credential Harvester. Um, now I've got a couple options. I can use a pre-built template that they've already got. Uh, I can clone an existing site or I could do something custom. Oh, custom is so hard. I just <laughs> want my Lamborghini. Um <laughs> Uh, oh, and I did this wrong. Okay. Uh, so one, two, three, website attack vectors, credential harvester. We're going to do a web template. Uh, and then it's going to say, uh, okay, so what's the address of your this, this server, the one you're running this on? And it, it actually fills that in for you. It's like, duh. Um, now, who do you want to clone? Who, who do you want to look like? And I'm going to go, you know what? Let's do Google. Let's, because universities often use Google for education and people are used to seeing the Google login page. So I could send you, Moro, like uh, we we use, we use uh, sh should I say this online? We use Google. We use Google Docs for our live stream planning. Yes, we do. I, yeah. I often share with you and our guests, uh, like send them a Google Doc and they yes. get that, that email and they just click the link to open the, the doc. Absolutely. So I could send you a very compelling one, but the link would go to this, right. Right. this thing. Your server, so gonna, your server to collect. That's right. And so I just hit, I just want to clone Google. Now you might've thought at this point, I have to do something fancy to, to like clone Google. <laughs> no, it's done. And literally it's like, okay, I'm cloning it. This could take a bit. Did it take a bit? Like, a millisecond and then it's like okay so this is now running on port 80 um and i'm going to display any information we steal so let's go over to our victim machine close this window uh we'll open a browser uh okay so now you know the hardest thing would be that i would have to register a dns name that goes to the ip address that i'm running that that uh, social engineering toolkit on. I'm just going to put in this. Um, the way you'd normally do this is you'd make a typo squatting domain. So yeah. you like a one letter difference or something highly obscure. Um, so we go there and this is look in the address. This is not Google in the address bar. Let me just make Let's this big for the audience. Sure this does is, look like Google. <laughs> now, okay, so I'm going to go. Uh, I am. Uh, Michael at cyberlibrarian.ca. Oh, funny aside before we continue. Uh, over a year ago, I was giving this same demonstration at an education conference in BC. And I'm on stage doing this demo. A lot of things in my demos went wrong. It was, it was a true t uh, test of character. I, uh, uh, I get off the stage... And I look at my email and uh, I have what looks like a, a very compelling phishing email. And I think there must be some jackass in the audience who's like, oh, I'm going to show the speaker that I'm cool too. And I'm, so I like fill in the thing and I put in my email address and I'm like, this is not my password. Buy me a beer. And uh, then all of a sudden I realized wait a second, 
is that real? So I contacted the company and I'm like, you know, uh, I got your phishing email. I'd really like to meet the guy who sent it. And they're like, no, 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 no. That was real. We were compromised. And uh, please disregard that completely. Oh, so wow. <laughs> it literally uh, at the very moment I was demonstrating social engineering toolkit, there was an actual criminal using it. Uh, and I just happened to get an email like that. Okay. So now here I'm about to I've typed in my email address and I'm going to type in not my password as my password. Now you'll notice what it did here. Don't say that. It redirected me to actual Google. Now what you'll see in the silent librarians attacks is um, they will on the first attempt you're going to their server on this but then their server redirects you to the real logon page so if you're not paying attention you'll go oh i must type my password wrong and you'll type in again and you'll be in and you won't even know that you got tricked now let's go back over to the attacker and see what we see okay so it's it showed that i connected here's my victim ip that's my windows machine and then it captured all the headers from the web transaction. Um, and then here we go. There's my email address. And there is my not my password. Um, <laughs> yeah. Easy. That easy. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And the silent librarian is it like, like this is too stupid easy. Uh, you you do not have to have um, knowledge or brains to be a criminal these days, oh, yeah. um, and that's that's kind of the sad part, right? Uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of kids are experimenting with this in grade school, and then they eventually graduate into becoming criminals, right? So, yeah, the the harder job is is uh, defending by yes. by by far. Um, so um that's the okay. end before we go offline though michael i was thinking let's review some of this and let's talk about possible ways to defend against this i oh. always forget to do that so <laughs> thank you that's a good idea <laughs> so uh i don't know if you want to put the uh, presentation up and then we'll just yeah. go each each yeah. thing and then we'll just kind of talk about something do you, do you want me to go back to the beginning or a specific one yeah, yeah let's go back to the beginning we'll just hit that and then we'll fast forward to the next actor next actor and then there so I anonymous see. um actually i'm thinking you know this is more of a don't believe what you hear it's a lot of hype in the news don't panic uh if you know if anything uh chances are if you get hit by these guys Again, as Michael had mentioned, website defacement, that's about all you're, I think you're going to really see from these guys. Um, Could be wrong. I think a really great, uh, I, I, I think you're right. Um, the damage you're likely to, the, the greatest impact you're likely to suffer would be from an overreaction. Exactly. Um, it, that they want you to take action that's to your detriment. I'll give you an example. During Op Petrol, um, my uh, my employer had been contacted by the Alberta sheriffs and by the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers and said, um, we've seen this announcement. You need to tell us what your plan is. And so a lot of people and organizations took it very seriously and came to me um, and said, drop everything. All projects and security canceled. This is your only priority. And I said, no, it's not. Um, so I produced a little dossier and a two-page summary of who the threat actor was that was making this, um, saying this isn't anonymous. This is a group called a non-ghost. Here's a history of the public things they've done, and here's what we're likely to see. What I'm going to propose is a period of heightened awareness so that um, the most likely thing we would suffer is a web face defacement. Yep. The second most likely would be denial of service. So let's talk to our ISP and see what we've got for mitigations of DDoS, if that occurs. And then let's monitor our websites and monitor them specifically for defacements and then put an extra on-call shift so that sh should something happen, we can respond within an hour. And then we made an agreement with the senior leaders 
that under the circumstances, it would be better to be down than defaced. So that they accepted the the remedial action we would take if we detected anything and we wouldn't have to get them out of bed at three in the morning and then uh, okay. the next day ask for forgiveness when we couldn't get their permission. We had their permission. That's it. Um, but yeah. the misinformation side is a much harder one to deal with. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I think that's a case where, uh, you know, uh, maybe if you're someone that's very active on social media, don't always believe or retweet or reshare what, what you think, uh, you know, maybe take some time, do your research. Because, uh, yeah, that's that's just how that's that's helping their cause. That's not, you know, really helping your cause. So, yeah, research before you retweet. Um, you don't have to uh, if if you see something that makes you feel a strong emotion, it's probably actually the best thing is to sit and think about it, not to spread that message. Um, exactly, exactly. So, uh, right, so our next, uh, who's, who's our next actor? Uh, oh, that's right, Cosmic Links. Uh, what do you think is a good defense here? I, I have my opinion. Yeah, obviously, I mean, you know, you got to be careful with your emails. You got to make sure that, you know, you recognize who's sending you that email. Even then, you have to question, would that person be sending me something like this, right? Uh, you know, and if you're an organization, obviously, don't just rely on your default, you know, spam filter, if you want to call it that. They're called secure email gateways these days. I would say, you know, invest in a good secure email gateway. There's tons of them out there. Make sure it's configured properly and keep on configuring it. Like, you have to keep tuning that. So that would be my recommendation for an organization and for an individual to just be cognizant that this is out there and be careful what you open. Um, I, I I would say that too. Um, <clears throat> we do have to have technical controls. We do have to have <clears throat> uh, malware systems that can filter most of this out. And we do. Um, but we have to recognize that they don't always work. And yeah. um, there's, th to me, the actual, the very first defense is financial controls. Uh, you might think about the impact this would happen, regardless of the likelihood, regardless of the likelihood. Um, if $3,000 was lost, uh, if $50,000 was lost, uh, uh. if 11 million, like uh, McEwen university, 11 million. And that's who these guys are going after now is big, big game, the big fish. Um, so financial controls are first so that there, it shouldn't be possible to transfer a large amount of money uh, without multiple people's consent. Okay. Most organizations have that. Some don't. Um, the second thing is, and I think this is a harder ask, but security awareness training really does work. And there's two things that work about it. One is if you're aware of the type of scam, you can recognize it and no. So it is a, just a constant case of being aware of what's a current scam. Cosmic links, seeing these examples is, a, is enough. But then the second thing is um, knowing that what they prey upon is a sense of urgency and authority and that you can accept that you would um, give into that. Um, and you might get caught, but if you're if you're aware that you could get caught yeah. that um, by these guys, that you'd do something different. You know, so something that's really easy. You know what? Uh, if you think that this is not legitimate or legitimate, why don't you call the person directly? If it's that urgent, why not call them and verify? Hey, is this really from you? You'd be surprised how much, how many times that can stop that. Like dead in its yeah. I had a client that didn't get hit by one of these. They they received the email. Um, they received the request to do the transfer. It's a very small company, but with a fairly large amount of um, cash reserves. And um, what what caught them is that the CFO and the CEO basically worked in the same office. Uh -huh. And the CFO got this email saying, I need you to transfer to this right now. Um, by the way, how's your daughter? Blah, blah, blah. And then she's like, that guy is such a jerk. Like... <laughs> 
<laughs> what what's he asking me about my kids? And then so she yelled over the cubicle at him. He's like, you know, yeah. if you want me to do it, you can just tell me to do it. You don't have to suck up. And he's like, tell you to do what? <laughs> <laughs> and then then they realize, and it's because they talk, it, albeit not in a friendly context, but um, right. But still, hey, it prevented that from happening. So, uh, yeah, Oof. this this one's hard. <laughs> There's no easy answer. Yeah, so. Um, uh, uh, don't oh. don't install software that you're supposed to install. Uh, you know, I think this is a case where uh, operational technology, OT operators, they need training. Uh, even then, this is going to be hard because, uh, I mean, you know, <laughs> the, the, the more interesting part is, you know, a lot of those o OT systems are actually connected into like, you know, Windows XP machines and things of that nature, too. So, I mean, they're really juicy targets. So... Yeah, I don't even know how to prevent this, to be honest. With um, you. I mean, other than... So advanced persistent threats are at the top of our worries because they are hard to defend against. Uh, we've got um, like our buddy Kyle. He is the antidote to an advanced persistent threat oh. and uh, a rare uh, gem. Um, but it's to describe the methods that he uses and that... Um, so for instance... Um, in uh, against Dragonfly, there are um, experts like Robbie Lee that um, know these threat actors and how to identify their more complex patterns very well. Segmentation, uh, user awareness training, yeah. monitoring, threat intelligence, um, there's uh, threat hunting, there's no end. Um, this is one of the hardest questions to answer. This is not to be taken lightly. And uh, I think I agree. I agree. I think I think segmentation is kind of where you got to start. Uh, and then you got to build on top of that. Uh, and I agree with you, Michael. Uh, threat intelligence is very, very important. I mean, especially if you have critical assets, these are like basically critical systems, they need to really, uh, I hate to say it, organizations need to start budgeting for protecting those systems because Historically, this is the thing that gets the least amount of attention and the least amount of budgeting. So, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to propose a starting point um, yeah. because working uh, in the past in oil and gas, the hardest thing I ever had was getting people to realize that advanced persistent threats were something that we should defend against because they are a cyber espionage threat and they try not to cause overt mm -hmm. harm. Um, for, uh, going back eight years, I would say, you know, there's indicators that they are planning to have the capability to cause harm. Um, and that has actually been borne out. So uh, gas plant operators would be in denial. They find a machine that's infected. I'd say we should investigate this. They say, nah, mm -hmm. the money's still being pumped out of the ground. Let's not do anything uh, until it costs us money. Well, just two years ago, we saw the first North American case of a gas plant that was shut down mm -hmm. uh, by an attacker. Um, and it was actually the safety systems that kicked in and shut the plant down to pr protect against harm. And we've seen countless other examples of actors like Dragonfly causing actual harm. So the first step is being aware that just because it's not hurting you today doesn't mean you shouldn't defend against an advanced actor. Uh, it it requires investment. Yeah. Um, but you know what, Michael, I, I think, I, I mean, I'm going to take a page out of your book on that one. Uh, as a final comment, uh, there's a lot you can do. Uh, it's better to, you know, take care of that low hanging fruit, uh, make yourself a, a really hard target. That'll make that'll make it more difficult for them. I mean, you know, it's, it's never going to be foolproof. But the more difficult of a of a target you make them, you know, the less likely they'll they'll um, want to come after you, unless they're specifically targeting you. In which case, you know, yeah, there's really not any I think level of <laughs> uh, technology that can help. Uh, training certainly does help, though. So I'm going to go through the last few rapid style because we're now at one hour and thirty minutes. Okay. Uh, Trickbot, Drydex, all of these stealthy malware that evolve and innovate. Uh, threat hunting. That's the way you deal with this. Uh, any other thought? Uh, you know, from an endpoint protection standpoint, I think uh, EDR, people need to, you know, really get on board with EDR rather than, you know, traditional uh, antivirus. Uh, 
Yep. Uh, uh, po- post exploitation detection and monitoring systems that give you great triage and investigation. Um, uh, this falls into the same category, except with Evil Corp, I'll remind of the money muling. This is really about international cooperation between um, law, uh, uh, legal uh, entities, and catching these guys isn't about a technical thing and it's not about threat hunting. No. I mean, maybe on an individual case, but what we have to do is disrupt this threat actor's ability to a hundred million dollars. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't even want to say what I think should actually happen. Doppelpamer. Um, uh, defending against the technical side of this threat um, is about threat modeling. You have to understand that their first entrance into your network, you won't detect. You will have your if you if you do nothing, the first thing you're going to see is when you're ransomware, when they tell you we are here. But okay, so and this was the thesis of this talk and variants of it I've been giving for years. There is this myth that we keep repeating in cybersecurity. And that myth is you are only as strong as your weakest link. It's a truism. And it leads us uh, down a path that I think is wrong, which is, okay, if you're only as strong as your weakest link, what you should do is find the vulnerable link and strengthen it and go from there. This puts us in a cycle of hunting for vulnerabilities, doing pen tests, vulnerability scans, bug bounties, uh, but it's a never ending game. We do need to do those things, but it's not enough on its own. Now here's the thing, flip the script. We are gonna say, oh, well the hacker only has to win once, we have to win all the time. No, the minute they compromise your network, they are now vulnerable because they only need to screw up once for us to catch them. If you understand the kill chain, if you understand the phases and TTPs of your threat actors, you can flip that script. And the minute they're in your environment, they are now the ones being hunted. We need to embrace that mindset. We often say we have to understand the attacker mindset. It's true. But do we understand our own mindset? Have we discovered what that is? That's how we defeat these actors. Yeah, so... um my comments are going to be a little bit different. Uh, okay. I'd say, uh, yeah, in this case, don't pay the ransomware. I don't care how bad your data is out there. Don't pay the ransomware. Uh, the, the the second part of that is have great backups, like really great backups. Uh, yeah. Not necessarily connected to your network. Um, regular backups, great backups. Uh, you know, I mean, there's lots of options out there for cloud backups that automate things. If you're, you know, worried about your personal data. Uh, obviously, you know, in, uh, password protect, uh, secure your data uh, as much as you can. So uh, that's just my point. But. Uh, I, w- I, I want to say don't pay the ransom, but increasingly that's not the victim's choice. Uh, it's their insurance company's choice. And we do need cooperation of insurance entities to um, that's a good point. Uh, basically regulate everyone who's insured and stop paying. Like literally, um, if you follow me on LinkedIn, you've seen me say this. Um, every like, if somebody pays the ransom, I'll say, "Today, so and so made an investment in cybercrime futures. They're accepting. They're expecting a negative payoff over the next three years as <laughs> cybercrime increases. That's a stupid investment to make. Yes, um, yes. I do understand the risk decisions that an individual will make, but this is not a microeconomic choice." Um, Okay, so finally, the silent librarian. Uh, uh, yeah, this this one's easy for me. It's like, where the hell is two factor authentication? <laughs> uh, yeah, it, they're they're. It, it's true. I mean, uh, you know what? As experts, we often like to say, "Well, there are ways yeah. to social engineer around it." But hey, you know what? The statistics don't lie. If you've got any form of MFA, even yeah. forms I don't like. Yeah, like the text, the SMS stuff. Yeah. I know. You're in the high 90s of protection. Yeah. Um, so MFA everywhere. I get annoyed. 
Um, so I have a whole bunch of Office 365 accounts, for universities. I'm addicted to taking courses. Um, <laughs> and they have MFA, but I get mm -hmm. prompted once in a blue moon for the MFA. And I don't have an option to say, please, every use. Yeah. And I yeah. get, I do understand how OAuth works, and but it makes me nervous. I really would like a yeah. MFA exactly. all the time. Yeah. I know most people wouldn't. Um, the other thing is, I mean, I want to say, oh, be aware of what gets typed into these bars. But the fact is the social engineering is quite compelling. Mm -hmm. Even smart victims can be tricked. Um, even I, I'm sure I could be tricked. Um, and, and the reality is, the other thing is, uh, a lot of people use the same password for all their accounts. Mm -hmm. And this is another way for them to get access to your Google, LinkedIn, Facebook. Then from there, it's corporate accounts and things of that nature. So really, I, I have to say, man, even on your personal stuff, I know it's a pain in the butt, but MFA. MFA all the way, man. Uh, all right. That's the all end great. of it. Do you have uh, any parting words, Moro? No. Uh, I want to say thanks to everyone for tuning in. Thanks to Michael for making that awesome presentation. Always entertaining. And apologies for going overboard on time again. But hey, man, it was a great topic. So We know people are going to skim it. Um, and happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to air on Halloween. Uh, I'm going to schedule it. For those of watching, uh, in particular, we made this for U of C students, SAIT students, Nate students, Bow Valley College students, uh, the MR Unis students who didn't see it um, when it was presented at your institution. If you've got questions about this, if you find it interesting, if you want to follow up, um, come into our Discord, um, and uh, and right. we will we'd be happy to answer those. Uh, you can meet Kyle the man who is the antidote to the ATP, APT. You can see me and Kyle argue constantly. Uh, a very healthy, respectful argument. Um, yeah, Kyle's like the Rambo, man. He's like the Rambo. Of <laughs> I'm just saying. You should see that guy in action. He's awesome. <laughs> our, our, uh, our industry needs perspectives, and our industry needs solutions, and our industry Absolutely. needs discourse. And Absolutely. that's what librarians try to build, knowledge. Um I think I'm going to use this um, same template as part of our intelligence uh, learning community that we've started. And we might profile some threat actors. And it's just an excuse for me to use these D&D &D <laughs> things, these D&D &D graphics again. Um, with that, I'm going to say thank you for watching this video. Ciao, everyone. I'll make the video go now, Michael. <laughs>